Oh, yeah, I know. Right. Again, everybody got messed up. That's right. It's too good. Alejandro, ¿cómo estás? Bien, tú? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you can please sit down. Finish your conversations. Delighted to be able to uh, introduce this very distinguished panel for the second half of our event today. The title of this uh, panel is Policy Implications for the Peña Nieto Administration. But in many ways, we're drawing on research that's been done here at the, uh, at the Wilson Center and, uh, and also, of course, with the Justice in Mexico pro uh, project out in, uh, in San Diego. I'm delighted to uh, welcome back some old friends, Alejandro Hoppe and Stephen Dudley. Ariel Mutsatsos from the embassy. It's great to have you here again with us. Thank you so much. Um, it is uh, obviously a great pleasure always to introduce my colleague, Chris Wilson, and delighted to make the acquaintance of Sandra Lay, um, who has written a fabulous paper on the link between uh, organized crime violence and voter turnout in, in Mexico. Um, we're going to kick straight off, um, but uh, before we do, I'd just like to say that, you know, in many ways, 2014 was an annus horribilis for, uh, for Peña Nieto. So many things went wrong from the beginning of the year all the way through. And one of the jobs that we have as a, as a think tank is, of course, to analyze uh, issues as they come up. But also, we believe it's our, our role to try to propose some kind of meaningful and positive policy prescriptions. And so that's some of the, what we hope will come out of this panel. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Wilson to kick off by talking about uh, his paper on Plan Tamaulipas. Great. Thanks very much, Duncan. Uh, do we have the clicker around here somewhere? Yeah, that Thanks a lot. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, I wrote this paper with uh, Eugenio Weigand. I, don't, I heard that he might be here today. I don't see him in the audience, though. But anyway, even uh, if he's not here, I want to thank him for his collaboration on, on this project. It was uh, a great, great work that we did together, and I certainly couldn't have done it without him. Uh, and then I also want to say that, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert on the security situation in, in Mexico or, or Tamaulipas, but I work a lot on the U.S.-Mexico border, actually principally on, on economic affairs, but also issues of migration and security and other things. So as a result of a lot of that work, I ended up spending some time this past year in Tamaulipas uh, and a lot of time also in South Texas talking to people that live in Tamaulipas or, or lived in Tamaulipas in many cases also. Uh, and, and I really, you know, just sensed after being there and talking to people uh, about the economic situation, the security situation, that, you know, there's just a lack of information out there about the case of Tamaulipas. A and there are reasons for that, uh, which I'll, I'll get into. But, you know, certainly high on that list is the pressure that journalists uh, and NGOs face that are working in Tamaulipas from organized crime and the difficulty they have in, in doing their job and getting the word out there on, on what's happening. Uh, you know, some of them have actually published reports or, or created reports that haven't been made public because of concerns that they have. Uh, I, you know, I want, I basically I, I want to thank those who are out there uh, putting information out there, allowing someone like me to try to, to pull things together, whether or not those things were made public or not. There, there are some people doing some pretty courageous work uh, that can allow us to do some sort of analysis like this uh, in the case of, of Tamaulipas. Um, let me jump in. Let's see here. So I want to just do a little bit on, on some of the context and, and causes of violence. I don't think this is an ex, ex, uh, exhaustive list, but, but a few, few comments. One you know, piece of the puzzle is certainly that Tamaulipas is a very important trafficking corridor. That's not just a drug trafficking corridor, uh, but a trafficking corridor in general. And that's linked to the fact that it's also a very important commercial corridor. You know, around 40% of all U.S.-Mexico trade comes through the, the, port, the, the, the port of entry at Laredo, Nuevo Laredo. So there's incredible volume of commercial traffic, licit commercial traffic that's happening there. There's also a large degree, the, the area right along the border uh, from about Laredo south is probably more populated. There's probably more, you know, miles of populated area on both sides of the border than anywhere else on the U.S.-Mexico border. There's a lot of small towns that make up the, the southern Rio Grande Valley. And that provides a lot of cover for all sorts of traffic that's happening also that's not happening through the official ports of entry. So migrants, whether they, they come into the United States, can easily disperse and disappear into the network of, of safe houses that exist on the U.S. side of the border. Uh, all sorts of trafficking that happens in that way. We know it's an important weapons trafficking corridor with weapons flowing to the south. Um, 
And all of that uh, makes the area incredibly valuable for organized crime groups. There's been a long history of trafficking, you know, going back to the precursors of the Gulf Cartel having to do with alcohol sort of bootlegging and, and all, there, there's a long history there. And so this is a, a, an area worth fighting for. Uh, and it's an area that's been fought over for many years. Uh, you know, primarily, you're talking about the, the Gulf and cartel and the Setas that have been disputing the area for in recent years, but also the <laughs> Sinaloa and other groups that have come in and tried to make incursions at different points in history. Um, some, some changes have happened, though, I in recent years. Uh, and, and I think some of those started with the arrival of the Zetas as an independent actor around 2010. Uh, but there's also some, been some very important changes that have happened with the fragmentation of the Gulf Cartel in the recent years also, uh, and maybe to a lesser degree, but, but also importantly to the Zetas in, in the recent couple of years. And we've seen a, a spike in homicides, in extortion, in violent robbery, and kidnapping during those periods, um, especially kidnapping that's now around six times the national average per capita in the state of Tamaulipas. It's, which, and, and we saw earlier with David's presentation that the, the national average has also gone up. So, some, so you've seen a spike on top of a spike that's happening nationally. Um, but now the, the dynamic you know, of one just fighting over trafficking corridors has shifted to one uh, you know, largely put to the, the Zetas and their business model of taking control of terrain and having several different types of criminal businesses uh, in each of those areas. And importantly, the move into other businesses besides trafficking, such as kidnapping, extortion, uh, violent robbery, you know, pipeline theft from Pemex, et cetera. Uh, crimes that have society as the target, uh, as the victim. That's a very important shift. And, and, and that's then also, you know, it hasn't just been the Zetas that have done that, though. Also, with the, particularly with the fragmentation and the weakening of the Gulf Cartel, we've seen, you know, the emergence of lots of groups in Gulf Cartel-controlled uh, cities to also be focusing on these types of crimes that really have society as the, the victims. And so right now, you know, now it's not just about fighting over corridors for trafficking, but it's also about fighting over territory to extract rents from the members of society and the violence that lands on society as a result of that. So that, that's a huge challenge. It also has negative economic consequences. You know, businesses that are extorted go out of business. Uh, investments are slower to come into the area as a result of that. You know, unemployment in Tamaulipas is higher than the national average in Mexico, which of course leads a cycle because that means there are more recruits available for organized crime groups in the area. So there's a bit of a cycle of, of violence and economic implications uh, in play as well. Um, let me move on. Deep penetration uh, and extreme intimidation of state and local government and police, uh, and with that also pressure on civil society and the press. I just have a sort of a, a <coughs> smattering of headlines and images of official sources that help us understand a little bit what that picture looks like uh, in the state of Tamaulipas, but it's, pretty, it's a pretty depressing picture. Uh, you know, regional security chief, which is, this has happened uh, in just last fall after the new security strategy was put in place, uh, from the you know, military general from the area of Nuevo Laredo, who was killed last fall. Uh, you know, Mexico investigating three former governors, the most recent three f past governors of the state of Tamaulipas a few years ago were all under investigation at one point by the Mexican government. More recently, Thomas Yardington, a past governor of the state, has had a, an indictment from the U.S. federal government unsealed that goes extend, it's a pretty extensive indictment, it's a pretty interesting read, you know, details pretty explicitly the way that public offices were sold uh, or, or there were payouts for public offices and that are relating to security, pretty deep collusion between uh, local and state officials and, uh, and organized crime groups in the state. Um, the, the, the pressure that's been put also on, I mean, it's not just, uh, it's not just collusion, but it's also intimidation, certainly. Uh, there have been multiple mayors that have been killed, uh, heads of, of police chiefs in, in different cities in the state. So this, and this has been happening for several years now. I mean, the first source that I have up there goes back to 2005, talking about uh, the state of the, the local police force in Nuevo Laredo being effectively controlled by, by the Zetas as they were a part of the Gulf Cartel at that point. Um, you know, th this is obviously, it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, I mean, I guess the, the bottom line in some ways is that the, the democratic transition 
has never arrived fully, that, that Mexico has gone through has never arrived fully in Tamaulipas. Uh, it's a state that's always been under PRI control, and I don't say that uh, as, you know, I don't bring that up as a problem because of the PRI, but I bring it up as a problem because transition of government matters. Uh, it's an opportunity for sunlight to be shed on the deeds of the past administration, and, and that type of sunlight has very seldom been shined on, on the deeds of past administrations in Tamaulipas, despite the fact that we have some uh, things coming through with these indictments. Um, but I, I think it points to a, a systemic problem of governance in the state that limits its capacity to respond to the intense pressure that's felt on the state because of its placement geographically uh, in, the, in the midst of one of the most important trafficking corridors through Mexico. That's a lot uh, of challenges to, to deal with. And Tamaulipas is doing it with very few police. Uh, these are, this is the most recent numbers, uh, just came out in November 2014, so I updated it from the paper, uh, but it's state and municipal police per, I did it per capita divided by population, and Tamaulipas comes in third from last uh, with right around 100 police per 100,000 citizens. That's way below, you know, most of the, the entities in Mexico. Um, and it's part of, I mean, th there's, a, there's a justification for it. A lot of police forces were disbanded in the state. Uh, you know, a lot of municipal police forces because of the deep levels of corruption. And there's a period, hopefully, uh, that's undergoing right now, which is a, a transition period to a new system of a state-level police. Uh, but in that interim period, we're, we're left with a state that's very lightly policed, and, and that has real implications. Numbers matter as well as the quality of police. Uh, so there's, there's a job to be done both in improving the quality because we have so many reports that show deep levels of penetration uh, of state and local police previously, uh, but also in numbers because the, the numbers that are there certainly uh, aren't up to the level of pressure that the state's under from, from criminal groups. Um, so, you know, as a result of, of these, I didn't show all of the stats, but as a result of some of the, the pressures the state's under, there was a, a new security strategy uh, that was announced last May uh, has, you know, it divided the state up into four different areas, zones, uh, had special uh, commanders uh, from the, the Navy or the Army for each of them, uh, left out Nuevo Laredo, which w was a bit strange, but later on the governor starts talking about that as sort of a fifth subzone in the strategy, so sort of tacking that on to the originally announced strategy. Uh, the objectives are right there, dismantling organized crime groups, closing down the trafficking routes, uh, and then guaranteeing uh, effective and sufficient, reliable security institutions. Uh, some of the different tools were put in place to help implement that strategy. Uh, additional federal security forces, I just wanna highlight that because given the, the lack of numbers of police, it's obviously important that something fill in the gap, right? There's some sort of a stopgap measure. So it, it makes, there were, there was an inflow of additional federal forces Federal Police, uh, Marines, uh, Semar, uh, the, the Army, uh, and more recently between two and 400 uh, gendarmerie. So that matters, that, that's an important thing that happened with the strategy. Um, renewed effort to build an accredited state police. So this is this transition to the mando unico, to a single statewide police. Uh, with the security effort, uh, with the security strategy, there was renewed focus on that. Uh, it's something that had been started before. It's not new to this past December. It's not new even to this, uh, you know, this plan. It's something that had already been underway before that, but had, had sort of failed attempts, if you, you know, according to most observers, in terms of creating really a reliable, trustworthy, not corruptible police force. So some of that's being started over once again now. Uh, which is another reason why we, we, everyone, everyone in the state uh, level police was revetted. So that's another reason why we have uh, the numbers that are on the lower side right now. Um, new anonymous crime reporting hotline, a new public security chief appointed by the federal government. As, I don't know if that's the, the he was appointed by the governor. Uh, he was a general. Uh, and it's with strong backing from the federal government. This is a different model than the Michoacan model of putting in a commissioner. Uh, it's a model that leaves the, the, the governor truly in charge of the state, but at the same time has a level of you know, imposition from the federal government. So this is a sort of a mixed model in some ways uh, compared to what happened in, in the case of Michoacan. And mili military supervision of the, the C4s, the command and control centers for the, the intelligence centers for police. Uh, that, you know, in large respect is linked to the anonymous tip hotline 
uh, trying to make that a, a more secure, reliable apparatus. And one of the achievements that, that's been claimed by the government is that the numbers uh, of reported crimes has gone up significantly since, uh, since this has been put in place. As we'll see very shortly, incidences of crime have not really improved. So that's you know, sort of a very limited success that we can claim so far from the operation, but maybe would give some reason to hope that things would improve in the future. Um, let me skip past that again. So this is you know, the, the most recent figures uh, for the last two years. This is sort of trying to look at uh, you know, high impact crimes and see if there's been a change in their tendency since the new strategy was put in place. It's obviously very new, so it's hard to, to say whether or not you should be seeing a major change in things, but homicides have gone up. Uh, kidnappings have stayed extremely high, probably gone up a little bit. Violent robbery has continued to go down. That was a trend that was underway previously, uh, and extortion has stayed pretty steady uh, as well. Uh, so the, the, the results aren't, aren't great so far. Um, I just want to point to one more thing before I, I conclude, and I'll try to do as fast as I can. Um, the role of civil society, uh, that's really, you know, except for this concept of the, the tip hotline, uh, and you see sort of one of their ads for it on the bottom right there, uh, that was sort of the, the effort to engage the citizenry, is try to create a, uh, a more reliable way to get citizen reporting of crime. That's an important thing. That's a very important thing. Uh, but I do think that engaging society, it's, it's a big challenge in Tamaulipas. Tamaulipas does not have the basic civil society infrastructure that some other places were that we could call success stories, moderate success stories in Mexico, like Ciudad Juarez, like Tijuana have. Uh, it's a more dispersed, the population of the state is more dispersed, a lot of medium-sized cities. Uh, I think that is a challenge for, for the, the depth of civil society capacity. Uh, so it's, it's been very hard for civil society to, to operate and certainly they've been subject to, to threats just like journalists have and you see some of the statistics about where Tamaulipas ranks in, in terms of Mexican states uh, by an attacks on journalists. But all that said, you know, there have been, there has been some of the, the beginnings of mobilization of citizens in Tamaulipas. We've seen things like the use of social media uh, that Catherine talked about earlier as a tool to inform. Uh, we've had some of those people be attacked. That is considered threatening to organized crime groups to have real information get out there about what's happening on a real-time basis. Uh, but we've also seen people take to the streets, uh, you know, numbers, reported numbers going to the range of about 10,000 uh, for demonstrations in the capital of Tampico. Uh, so there, there's been some, certainly some awakening. I mean, I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, some local business groups closer to the border who are also active and trying to communicate and work with the local generals. I mean, I see just the little hints of a spark uh, of some things that could lead to a stronger reaction from society. And, and one of the things that I would hope to see more of from the, the security strategy from the government would be an effort to reach out, foster, and engage, and, and, and work with those efforts as nascent as they might be. Um, let me just leave it there and we can go into more detail and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, in the Q&A, we'll be able to come back because there's a number of policy uh, prescriptions in the, uh, in the paper by Chris and Eugenio that, uh, that are relevant to pull out here, particularly based upon the previous research we've done here in the Mexico Institute. Sandra, if I can turn the microphone over to you and if you'd like to talk about uh, the paper that you've prepared. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, first of all, thank you to the Wilson Center, especially to uh, Duncan Wood and David Schur for the invitation to write this paper, which uh, extends from a... Um, from my, my PhD dissertation, which focuses uh, on what's th what are the political consequences, in particular, looking at the citizens' reaction, uh, whether to vote or not to vote, if voting, how to vote. So in that, that sense, it relates a lot to what Christopher was talking right now. Um, and so it has been discussed so far that while homicides have experienced a downward, downward trend, other crimes such as extortion and kidnapping have not developed in the same way. Uh, the case of Ayotzinapa further reveals uh, the unresolved and growing phenomenon of, of disappearances, uh, beginning with the fact that there is no reliable data from which to derive or guide policies that may be able to address this issue. Um, just yesterday, the Mexican uh, federal government acknowledged that 23,271 persons are still missing. And this number is still not completely reliable because we are not exactly sure which ones are, uh, what, what kind of disappearances we're talking about. Um, in addition, during the past two years of the Peña Nieto administration, organized crime has attacked 130 public officials and political candidates. 
Uh, this represents 40% of all such events occurring throughout the six years of the Calderon administration. And I can talk more about how, what, where this data is coming from. It's a pro joint project between a uh, faculty member of Notre Dame, uh, Guillermo Trejo and me, that we have been conducting this count of, of events. Um, and so what the question that, that is, uh, from which I'm inspired for my research is, how have citizens reacted to these trends? Uh, what could possibly, how, what could we possibly expect in the upcoming election, and what can or should be done? Uh, I guess the most immediate and observable reaction that, that has caught the attention of, of media worldwide uh, in the past few months has been civilian protest. Uh, as a result of the disappearance of 43 students in Iguala Guerrero, massive mobilizations have taken place inside and outside of Mexico. Um, since October 2014, uh, more than 200 protest events against violence have been organized in Mexico. This is the highest peak of mobilization, even compared to the waves of protest uh, in the previous administration. For instance, during the highest peak of protest during the Felipe Calderon, during, under the administration of Felipe Calderon, in, in, which it was in 2011, uh, 270 protests took place uh, throughout that year. And that is going back to the movement, uh, the movement for peace, with just for justice and dignity uh, during the year throughout the year where uh, it, it organized a, a series of caravans and marches for peace. But a similar number of protests have been organized in just the last three months of the Peña Nieto administ administration. So that's the last peak that you see right there. Um, and so what has brought so many people, this is, so this is an update that you don't get in the, in the paper because when we wrote the paper, when I wrote the paper, paper, that was happening at the same time. But this is sort of previous data that I've been collecting since, collecting since then. Um, and so the question is what has brought so many people out to the streets? Uh, so the case of the 43 missing students in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero, is a clear example of collusion between organized crime uh, government officials and police forces. Um, many of the previous cases that had been made public through the Movement for Peace, for example, had followed the same pattern. It had, that, it had been revealed uh, before, uh, but proving this point is not an easy task for relatives of victims uh, who are often faced with authorities that are unwilling and incapable of investigating forced disappearances, more so when their colleagues are involved. Um, so Ayotzinapa demonstrates that violence has been directed against, uh, that another issue that it demonstrates is that it has been directed against the Mexican youth. 22% uh, of victims of violence in Mexico are young people between the ages of 18 and 25 years old. Uh, and this has led to act the activation of the student networks, among others, which goes back to the questions that we had in the, in the previous panel. Uh, mobilizing schools and colleges that had not participated in past waves of protest. Uh, and, and that's, I don't have it up here, but if you go into the paper, uh, in the paper that I wrote, you will see that as it was being discussed before, civic society networks are fundamental for, for, the, for the occurrence of this protest. Uh, it is through networks that victims and participants can reshape their perceptions of risk and of risk and benefits, because as has, as it has just been said, uh, uh, right now, uh, really participating in this protest is not an easy or straightforward decision. There are many risks that are involved, um, and 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 we can see how important networks become uh, in terms of being able to put issues on the public agenda, in terms of uh, exposing governmental wrongdoing. And sometimes also it could help resolve some cases. And for this, we, we have some examples in Monterrey, uh, the organization CADAC led by Hermana Consuelo. Those are the kinds of, it, it has been able by moving uh, in, a parallel, in a parallel road between um, mobilization and the streets while at the same time working with authorities, being able to resolve some of those cases. Uh, and, and, and so, and then revealing to this collusion between organized crime and public officials, which I, I here I have to recall um, Emilio Alvarez y Casa's uh, 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 announcement when when uh, when Nayot Sinapa uh, uh, came into the media and he, with him saying, "Well, the surprising thing about Yotzinapa is that people are surprised because this is something that we had been seeing over and over again." 
Uh, and, and, and protest has been a great, uh, has played a very important role for this to actually become public. Societal accountability mechanisms such as social protests can do this, can put these issues on the agenda, which can be, can, are fundamental to do, and which sometimes electoral forms of participation are not so straightforward in putting that into the public agenda. But as I was saying, uh, taking part of such, of such actions is really not an easy or straightforward decision. Uh, citizens who participate in these in this actions are further exposed to violence and retaliation by criminals and, uh, and colluded officials. In some other ca cases, protest is simply met by repression, as it was the case actually just yesterday in the state of Puebla. Uh, the fact that protests have continued to grow uh, in the midst of violence could lead us to believe that uh, there's a positive association between violence and a politically active citizenry. But this conclusion would be incorrect. And, and because first of all, there is a point in which violence uh, does keep people from participating. And so that's the has, that has been the case in Tamaulipas. And in, uh, uh, again, in, in, in the paper, I have a, a, a map and showing the, the geographical distribution of, of, um, of, of protest. And what you see is that precisely Michoacán and Tamaulipas, which are cases that have been greatly affected by violence, have not been able to produce as much, to generate as much social protest as, as it has been the case of Guerrero, for example, or Chihuahua, because of the lack of civic networks, the lack of, 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 of civilian organ organizations that are able to connect people and, and, and pose protests as an, as, as an option for, for, uh, uh, for societal, societal accountability. Um, and second of all, as my analysis shows, while violence has, has pushed some people out to the streets, it also tends to pull citizens away from the polling booth. So why is that? Um, in a recent analysis, as I said, uh, conducted by Guillermo Trejo, faculty of the University of Notre Dame and me, we found that elections are key focal points at which criminal groups infiltrate uh, local politics. Alternation of parties in government can open new opportunities for groups uh, to gain territory and establish, uh, and establish a new set of protection arrangements uh, with local authorities. And violence and bribery are among the main tools available uh, to organize crime uh, to push for such political reorganization. Uh, as mentioned before, during the Peña Nieto administration, we have already seen 130 of such attacks against political parties and public officials. And these kinds of events deeply transform the electoral experience, deeply transform elections and voters' perceptions of insecurity, particularly in association with their political activity. So first of all, as candidates become targets of violence, the pool of candidates is deeply transformed. Uh, for instance, during, during the 2011 election, electoral process in, in Michoacán, local authorities revealed that 51 candidates quit their campaigns. It doesn't mean that there, were, that there were 51 candidates not running. They maybe had replaced, but the question is, who's, re who's replacing? What kind of candidates then do, do people get? How does electoral competition uh, get affected? It will be important to pay really close attention to how this figure evolves in the upcoming election in Michoacán. Uh, and given that uh, it's also the case that criminal groups attack public officials, and this kind of violence, given that it receives great media attention, it also inevitably changes the political environment in which elections take place, as well as perceptions of, of insecurity and incentives to participate in elections. Um, and what I find is that this type of violence only results in, well, well that was a, from the previous, and that, that's what I want to focus right now. This type of violence only results in lower participation. Uh, so as, uh, as the number of violent events in a given municipality increase, the, uh, uh, the number of people, the percentage of turnout decreases. Uh, and, and it has not only been the case in, uh, from the, uh, in, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it has, hasn't been limited to the Calderon administration. We've, we, we saw a bit of it in 2013, for example, in San, in San Bernardo de Durango. There was a case in which there was only one candidate that was running. And so you wonder what is what re, what's the electoral choice that voters have really in those kinds of, situ of situations? Uh, what are the chances of freely uh, having freely exerting your vote, your right to vote, uh, and and having a chance to choose? There's no one to choose to, to actually cho to choose from, and so incentives to participate really go down. 
Uh, as, a, as a recent survey from Parametria revealed just a few days ago, 36% of Mexicans consider uh, public insecurity really limits their, abili their ability and willingness to participate in the upcoming election. Uh, and so in that regard, we must also recall that threats against voters, against voters, not only candidates and public officials, have taken place in the states of Michoacán, Guerrero, and Tamaulipas in, the, in past elections. So violence clearly has a negative if impact and turnout, even if we only look at the homicide rate. So as the homicide rate increases, the percentage of people going out to the, uh, going out to the polling booth also decreases. Uh, approximately, to give you some figures, for every, cr criminal, for every event of criminal violence against political actors in a given municipality, turnout decreases in about 2%. Uh, for every one unit increase in homicide rate, there's also a, a decrease in homicide rate. While these while this numbers may seem small, when you're thinking about elections that are, uh, are, that are competitive and where you're thinking about at the aggregate level, those numbers are re do matter. Uh, and this is uh, uh, this really makes us puts us to think about what's com what's going to happen in the upcoming election. We know that 17 Mexican states will hold elections uh, this year. Two of these states, Guerrero and Michoacán, have particularly violent profiles, as the previous panel uh, 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 discussed. Um, other states, however, such as Nuevo León, Morelos, uh, Estado de México, also continue to face uh, security challenges. Uh, that will transform, once again, the perception that voters have and the context in which elections take place and incentives to participate in them. Uh, but I'd like to focus in Guerrero Michoacán a bit uh, to, to close my, my participation. Between 2013 and 2014, Guerrero accumulated 17 attacks against public officials and party activists. In the case of Michoacán, of Michoacán this figure is higher with a total of 23 attacks. This is above and beyond any other, uh, the, the number of attacks in any other of the states that are holding elections next year, next, ne next June. Uh, and so we must pay really close attention to these states, not only because of these numbers, but also because other on, of other ongoing issues in the states. In the case of Michoacán, the presence of self-defense groups, as David Shirt discussed, adds yet another level of complexity. Violence and confrontations uh, between these groups in the, just the very first few weeks of this year have already occurred uh, without really having a really good sense of what's going on and how, that, how things might change. In Guerrero, the electoral authorities have already been unable to keep up with the originally planned electoral can calendar. The activities planning preparation for the upcoming election have been affected by social protests. Uh, which have been occurring precisely in relation to uh, ongoing violence and prevailing insecurity. The Instituto Nacional Electoral, the, federal, the Mexican Federal Authority and federal government uh, just yesterday announced that they would, make any, every, they would make every effort possible to hold elections in Guerrero. And these efforts are definitely necessary, uh, but the reality is that ci citizens cannot become truly engaged with democracy and with elections until they see an effective response from the government and experience greater security and institutional effectiveness. And precisely, uh, uh, the recent calls uh, uh, for blank or spoiled ballots are a reflection of this lack of trust in government. Uh, in violent uh, contexts, such as the ones that I just described, uh, combined with increased cases of corruption scandals and prevailing impunity, calls for boycotting elections are understandable. Uh, violence continues and uh, impunity prevails. However, it's important to note that uh, experiences for previous election uh, and, and separate analysis that I have conducted shows that voters do take into account the performance, the authorities, their, their, their authorities' performance in the control of violence when deciding who to vote for, or to put it another way, who not to vote for. Um, and this is important because it suggests that in the midst of violence, there's still hope for electoral accountability. So just as societal accountability, taking to the streets may be important for putting some issues in the, in the public agenda and, the, and, and making public what's going on, uh, electoral accountability is a parallel uh, road that in which we have to walk on in order to uh, actually demand authorities to do something about what's going on. But it, this electoral accountability greatly, greatly depends on voters' willingness to take part in elections and get informed about what their authorities are doing. And that's not an easy task either. But we have to make every effort to make that happen. 
um, guaranteeing voters conditions, uh, uh, conditions of security for voters to go out to the polling booth and express their vote in a most of the most free uh, way possible is not the only, it's, it's not only the responsibility of the electoral authority. It is a collective effort that is, starts from uh, having effective uh, screening and monitoring of candidates and campaigns, uh, but also it's, a, it's the responsibility of, uh, the, of authorities more generally of building a stronger and political institutions to control violence and exercise justice. And it's also the effort of citizens that are actively willing to get informed, demand justice, and respect for their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, moving right along, let's uh, ask uh, Alejandro to give us uh, your uh, your outlook on uh, on security in Mexico this uh, for this year and uh, some of your policy prescriptions. Thank okay. you. Um, could you put present? Okay. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, thank you, Duncan. Um, uh, thank you to Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for setting up this uh, this very timely um, event. I'm pretty sure if this has had taken place, say, six months ago, uh, probably the crowd would have been half of what it is right now. I mean, six months ago, it was all about energy, it was all about reform, it was all about the Mexican moment. Um, I mean, Mexico had turned the corner. And yet, six months later, we're here talking pretty much about security. Um, we all thought it was so 2010, so Calderon uh, seems it is not. Uh, and I'm going to try to tell you a tale why I think this happened, uh, what led to this sudden return of security to the foreground of Mexico's public agenda. Um, and, uh, you have to understand what, where, uh, I mean, to understand the backlash, you have to understand where we're coming from. And say, even for the past the first two years of the administration, I mean, they were sounding, government, government officials were sounding really triumphant notes. Uh, let me see how, um, um, just give me, let me give you, and, and those triumphant notes were becoming ever louder over the past few months. Let me give you a couple of, of uh, statements made over the past, uh, in August, i.e. one month before Iguala. I mean, this is from the National Security Commissioner, Montalejandro Rubido. Uh, he said, well, we could ask whether 19 homicides per 100,000 is a manageable level. And the definitive response is yes, which is an interesting way of describing a uh, homicide rate that is six times, three times the global average. But anyway, that's what they were saying. Um, and also, this was coming from the top. I mean, this was uh, President Peña Nieto said August 22nd, 2014, I, um, Iguala minus 34 days. Um, it said that the security and justice policy implemented by this administration is effective and has delivered good results to the Mexican people. Um, and let me be clear, there were some reasons for optimism. Um, or what were they? Well, homicides were definitely down. Um, let me see. So, I mean, let me see if I can, uh, can approach this. Um, I mean, intentional homicides have declined for three years in a row now. Um, they were down about 30% down from the peak of 2011. Um, part of it may be explained by policy, part of it may be explained by other factors that we don't really understand. But, but indeed, I mean, homicides, I mean, which were the, the, locus of the, the locus of the security crisis under the Calderon administration, are definitely on the way down. Um, but also, I mean, uh, uh, the, the government could point to some, to some successes, particularly in terms of bringing down some of the major campaigns in the country, B beginning by, uh, with the big ones, the big one. Uh, Joaquin Guzman Loera, a.k.a. El Chapo, the head of the, of the Sinaloa cartel. I mean, this was uh, once uh, declared in, say, in Chicago, the successor of Al Capone, the public enemy number one. And that means very the, the Mexican government did a very, very successful operation and brought him down, captured him. Um, and it, well, he was not the only one. Uh, they killed Nazario Moreno, who was uh, the head of the Knights Templars, uh, who was thought to be dead, and apparently he was not, uh, but now he is. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, and this, this was also a major, I would say, a major triumph for Mexican intelligence and Mexican security agencies. 
Also, Vicente Carrillo Fuentes, a.k.a. El Vicero, he was the head of, of the, the, the Juarez the Cuartel, uh, the brother of the famous or infamous Lord of the Skies uh, in the 1990s, also captured recently. And uh, the last remaining brother of the Beltrán Leyva uh, dynasty, Héctor Beltrán Leyva, a.k.a. Lache. And there are several of these are only some examples. There were several other major campaigns that were either killed or captured. So, I mean, this was, this was pointing uh, apparently in the right direction. Um, and lo and behold, even perception was improving. Perception security, at least uh, over the past, this comes from Inehi, um, the perception, people, uh, this, uh, they ask every three months whether people are feeling safe or not, and you see from, say, March through September, yeah, people were starting to feel a bit safer. Um, but then, uh, of course, then came Igual. Igual, I'm not going to give you a blow by blow um, a, a blow by blow uh, account of what this happened. If you want to read one, there's a very good one in this month's Nexus uh, by Esteban Illades. I would invite you to all, all of you to read it um, if you read Spanish. Uh, but we had basically a massacre. 43 students were, were kidnapped and probably killed. Uh, and six others were killed before that, that event happened. Um, which detonated a massive and unprecedented in terms of scale, as Sandra just described, a movement of protest against violence and very particularly against the government, and which created a crisis of significant proportions for the government in terms of public opinion. Uh, according to Reforma, to Reforma Daily, which conducts quarterly, uh, quarterly uh, opinion surveys, uh, President Peña Nieto approval rating is the lowest of a Mexican president since the, the mid-1990s. Um, he's probably at 39% according to a series. Um, and pretty much every other, other survey points in the same direction even the, if the level changes. So, but we have to ask why? Why Iguala? Why, what, did, what, what is special this is about this particular incident? Uh, it's certainly not the worst thing that has happened in Mexico over the past few years. Um, the massacre of Central American migrants in San Fernando, Tamaulipas, that was 72 people. Uh, the second massacre of San Fernando in April 2011, that was 280. Uh, the massacre in Allende, Coahuila, uh, also 2011, that was probably 300, 400, maybe more. Uh, so what's so special about this? Why what didn't those those events detonate a, the type of reaction that this event has detonated. Um, I'm not, not going to give you a definitive answer because I don't have it, but let me just try to, to put uh, out some uh, hypothesis. First is the fact there was direct involvement of the authorities, or local authorities, beginning with the mayor who is this guy who is uh, there sitting with his wife who apparently was the sister of a major drug trafficker. Uh, so this is not that, this, I mean, this is, this is one extreme case of capture of local authorities by a criminal gang. And the municipal police force of Iguala and the municipal police force of the neighboring town of Cocula directly participated in the kidnapping, the abduction of the 43 students. So uh, that, that was, I mean, it's not the first time that a that similar event happened, but this was much more fully documented than in other instances. Uh, secondly, and very importantly, the victims. The victims are, were uh, connected to a pre-existing activist network in a way that other victims were not. The Ayotzinapa Rural Teacher School has been a hotbed of activism for 50 years. Uh, you can see there, there's a picture there where you, uh, of, the, of the Ayotzinapa School. You, have, you see a picture of Lenin, of Che Guevara, and this guy on the left is Lucio Cabañas, who was a leader of of the Me Mexican guerrilla movement in the 70s and a graduate of the Ayotzinapa school. So this, the school of Ayotzinapa was connected to a radical faction of the teachers union, was connected to some of the factions of the community policing, uh, police uh, movement in, in Guerrero, they were connected even probably through some intermediaries connected to the remnants of the Mexican guerrilla groups that are still present in Guerrero. So, I mean, you had this, these victims were plugged into that, that network, network of activism in a way that, say, the Central American victims that were killed in San Fernando in 2011 were not. 
So th this, th this was, there, was, there, was, there was more of an infrastructure for a protest movement afterwards. Um, uh, I don't know why. Can anyone help me with this? Uh, okay. Um, thirdly, um, uh, we have to be blunt about this. I mean, uh, the, the, the official response, the, at least the initial official response, was sloppy, was uh, um, not very effective. Uh, the federal government intervened one week after the fact. The initial week, the initial and crucial week, the investigation was headed by the local Procuraduría, the le local attorney general's office, who decided that they were going to, l to look for the students house by house to see if they had, hit, uh, they had hidden themselves. I mean, this is an official statement they've made. Um, uh, this is, I mean, and uh, this was, this was in, uh, the PGR, the Federal Attorney General's Office, intervened one week afterward. They had been effective in the sense of arresting most of people involved. They have arrested so far 97 people, but the political management of the of the case has been a very um, um, subpar for such a politically savvy group. Um, this is um, four months into the crisis, President Peña Nieto has yet to visit Iguala. Uh, the President Peña Nieto took more than a month to meet with the parents, took him more than a month to meet with the parents of the, of the disappeared students. Um, and uh, famously, in a press conference, the Attorney General, uh, um, uh, Murillo Karam, said, finished the press conference with the words, ya me canse, I'm tired. Uh, we detonated the longest lasting uh, trending topic in Mexican Twitter history. It's still going on. <laughs> um, and this, is, this was seen as a sign of indifference towards the pain of those of the victims. Uh, whether it was or not is, is a matter of discussion, but at least into the perceptions matter. Um, and finally, and this is I think an important uh, point, is that the Iwala case subverted one of the favorite tropes of the government's discourse in terms of security, which is that the key to security, the key to lower uh, levels of violence was coordination with subnational uh, sub authorities, which of course there was, but there was coordination with this guy, for instance, which was the governor of Guerrero, um, uh, who, was, who had tolerated the existence of a, of a narco governing Iguala, and probably promoted a narco governing Iguala. Yes, there was a lot of great coordination with that guy, but coordinating with some of those guys are coordinating directly with criminal gangs. Um, and it's very interesting that now no one's uh, coordination has no longer, no longer played such a big role in terms of the discourse of the of the, of the administration, um, and because the, the diagnosis of the of the incoming Peña Nieto administration in 2012 is that violence was mostly an issue of political management, that the strategy was basically sound, but they needed really politically talented people to implement it. Um, and uh, and uh, so that if you could only bring everyone to the table, uh, violence would start coming down. And and this, I think, this took a hit. This really took a hit with the Iguala, with the Iguala uh, incident. Um, and after a while, I mean, it took the government uh, a, a while to to respond. To the um, to the crisis, but uh, and finally they finally did, or at least <coughs> they tried to do it. On November 27, President Peña Nieto unveiled a 10-point plan, uh, a 10-point plan uh, on on security and justice. Um, I'm not going to to delve into the details, but just let me tell you the two big ones. Uh, one is they are they want. They want really. Uh, uh, they, they want a, an express way of deposing, of deposing at, uh, uh, crime infiltrated municipal governments. Um, and secondly, they want to eliminate all municipal police forces and create single state police forces. Um, my take on this, very personal take on this, is that this is bad policy and this is bad politics. Um, it is bad policy. 
because you already have some instruments to deal with organized crime infiltrated municipal governments. They can try the mayors that are involved. They can send them to jail. It has been done in the past. It can be done in the future. Why do they need a a fac why do they need this faculty that can't subvert the democratic process? I'm not sure. They, they already have some instruments to deal with this. Um, and regarding, regarding single state police forces, we really need to ask very hard whether state police forces are necessarily better, necessarily more honest than municipal police forces. Uh, according to a recent report uh, published by Causa en Común, a, a uh, civil society organization, um, out of the 40,000 police officers that have not passed the vetting process known as control de confianza, about 22,000 came from state police forces, as opposed to about 18, 19,000 from municipal police forces. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, in 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 terms of uh, uh, oversight, in terms of, of a external external internal control of police forces, you don't see so much better. You don't see the the, the state police forces that are so much better than than others. And even 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 uh, and if you eliminate municipal police forces, you're also eliminating a source of innovation, a source of experimentation. I'm not saying that all should survive, but eliminating every, each and every one of them, I think that's a problematic issue. And I would just point it, I mean, this is an interesting case that I, that I found out about this uh, recently. About a month ago, municipal police officers of a uh, place called Ciudad Nezahuel Coyot, which is a, a municipality surrounding Mexico City, detained state police officers that were in, from the state of Mexico that were engaging in kidnapping, which it's kind of very ironic given what we're discussing. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of politics, this is not really solving the problem for the government. In many ways, this is being perceived not as reform, but as a power grab. And, and it, is, it is setting, and the government, I'm pretty sure that assent on December 1st, I think December 1st, December 2nd, the bill sent by President Peña Nieto will not pass, will not be approved. It, they could be setting themselves up to their, for the first significant legislative defeat of the administration. So I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what they think. And in terms of public opinion, it's really not doing the job. So. <laughs> Just, just uh, are there alternatives? Yes, but I'm going to talk to you about them uh, 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 probably in uh, the discussion period because we're we're running out of time. But let me just conclude with this. I mean, this is during one of the first Ayotzinapa mar marches. People wrote on this Mexico City Zócalo in the on the, uh, the main square of Mexico City. They wrote the phrase "Fue el Estado." It was the state who did it. And yes, it was not the. I mean. This, is, this created a lot of controversy in Mexico because, in a sense, it is, it is not true. I mean, there were no, not the state police officers that pulled the trigger. But in a, in a deeper sense, yes, it was the state who did. The state failed in protecting its citizens. The, fail, the state failed in reforming its institutions. It is a form, it, it is a collective responsibility for Mexican, the Mexican political system what happened in Iguala. And things will not improve until and unless we start recognizing that fact. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, Stephen, please jump in. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks for everyone for hanging out. Um, it's getting late here. Um, I guess the first uh, uh, reaction I think about to 2014, I was a little surprised. I guess I was a little stunned to go through the whole first uh, panel and not really have a mention of, of the Chapo um, question. Um, you know, you, you're, you're talking about 2014, you're talking about big events in 2014, you're doing a review of 2014, and Chapo barely comes up. I think that's a little bit unfair, would be my, my, my first response to all this. Um, you know, because I think that that, 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 is, that is a success. It does take a certain amount of coordination, intelligence gathering, um, actions uh, on the part of, of various institutions coordinated over, over a long period of time in order to make captures such as those, and they've made several captures like that. 
Um, so if I were to go back and look at 2014, I would say maybe it's a, it's the it's a transition period, if you will. It's a transition period from when when the focus is on these large. Um, you know, so-called monolithic criminal organizations like the Sinaloa cartel and is shifting more towards the Guerreros Unidos. And those, in, in, in a way, it was kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the events played out almost in a, in a, in a perfect bookend. Um, but the, 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 the Peña Nieto of, of early 2014 was, was one obviously riding high, and we, we've all talked about that. And the Peña Nieto now is, is one that is, that, is, that is reeling. And, and I would... I would go back even a little bit further than Alejandro to talk about wh why, why I think this is happening. What, what has undone this, this narrative of Mexico's moment? Because for me, that, that's the big question now going, going forward. Um, you know, how, how does he rewrite this narrative? How does Peña Nieto rewrite this narrative? But first, what, what were the things that I think that really stood out to me, especially during 2014, that kind of undid this narrative? And the first one I would point to would be Michoacan. Um, in our report uh, for the Mexico Institute and in Inside Crime, you know, we, we wrote that uh, the desperation in Michoacan, as in many parts of Mexico with regards to organized crime, has led to a myopic view of this issue. In the short term, it produced, through the mil militias at least, a temporary solution to the immediate problem, the Knights Templar. In the medium to long term, however, it may have opened up space for another set of criminal actors and complicated the government's job of establishing rule of law in Michoacan. And I'm sad to report that we were correct. Um, for me, the, the Michoacan issue, um, you know, it's still, it, it lingers, and it has lingered now for nearly two years, um, and it's lingered on the minds of people for two years, and it hasn't gotten any better. Violence has gotten worse. Extortion, uh, complaints of extortion have gone up. I don't think that they've addressed some of the core issues at stake here, um, the, the, the legalization or integration of these groups or meshing of these groups with local authorities. For me, there's no clear strategy there. But the larger conclusion to this, and this goes back to the narrative, is that the link, there's a lingering sense that the Mexican government still has in control, doesn't have control of huge swaths of territory. And that is a major problem to have lingering around for nearly 18 months now. The second major event I would point to would be the, and I'm going to massacre this name, Tatlaya. Ta, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, but this is a very important event, um, n not because it's, it's new, because we have been covering the, these types of events uh, for several years, um, and, and the event in, in question has to do with what appears to be um, a mass execution by the military. Um, of suspected criminals. We've been covering these, these interactions, if you will, these confrontations between what the military terms in their press releases as aggressors since at least 2011. And the, and the, the, the disparity between the numbers of victims we often see in these clashes and the number of, of casualties on the military side, which we've always found, you know, having a lot of experience region-wide and looking at conflict, we see the disparities is huge. In some instances, you have 27 dead with one injured. In this instance, you had 22 aggressors is what they call them, dead, and you had one injured soldier. And thereafter, you had something that was something that hadn't happened before, which was the government came out and said, well, the Human Rights Commission came out and said, yes, they did indeed kill at least 15 of them. So now you have an institution which has been propped up as one of the most trustworthy institutions um, by polling that we have in Mexico, and all of a sudden its, its sort of activities can be called into question, at least reaching back to 2011. And the third event is, of course, Iguala. And I think that I, I won't have to go into much detail at all because I think Alejandro laid it out perfectly. Um, and even we can step back further with regards to Iguala, uh, a story we wrote, which we titled The Crime Foretold, um, and all about the events leading up to Iguala, which included a very strong accusation and investigations on the part of the Attorney General's office of murder by the mayor. Not just anyone, not that he sent out people to murder someone, but that he actually murdered someone, shot somebody in the face, killed them, and happily so, according to quotes that were gathered uh, from the investigation itself. So these things were, 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 were brewing in this area for a long time, and they also included disappearances, 
They included, you know, intimidation tactics um, and obviously reports of, and there was one um, graphic that Alejandro put up, which he, which he didn't actually make reference to, but the, the, that, was, that was a picture of all the mayors, and I believe there, was a, there were 10 of them or so, that were implicated in some way in criminal activities in Guerrero. Yes, so that, that's just one uh, state. So these things have been brewing for a long time. So in many ways, this was a crime foretold that was largely ignored by this larger narrative or this sort of we're going to bury the crime issue over at least, you know, several year period. They were obviously slow to react. Um, you know, we, 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 we've seen them, um, you know, arrest a number of people, come out with a number of of, uh, of reports, uh, even show us some of the forensic reports from Europe um, and, and have all these, these different things flashed in front of us, yet the populace, the population in general does not buy it. And that's the conclusion at this point of, of, of the Iguala case is that they, that, that, that for some, for, for, for all these reasons and more that Alejandro laid out, there is the sense that the president just doesn't get it. He just hasn't wrapped his head around this issue yet, and not even to the extent that he understands that he needs to go to Iguala, he would need to engage much more uh, with these groups that are protesting, et cetera, et cetera. This is by far the biggest challenge, and as Alejandro laid out, it's largely a political challenge, and that's, that's my major upshot here, that, there, that, that, that these have been painted in a way that from the beginning, the Peña Nieto administration has been about painting this in a political way, painting this picture, creating this narrative. Um, and, and there have been a lot of reforms, real reforms, institutional reforms that have not been happening, that have, that have either been paralyzed or just, just have not, not been pushed forward at all. And, and now, now that facade is gone. And 2015, if I were looking forward to 2015, for me the big question is, can the president move beyond the notion that he can bury this, this crime issue? So far for me, there's very, very little indication that he can take this tact. Perhaps we'll, we'll hear a little bit about more what's coming in the, uh, in the future shortly here. But, you know, he can no longer fake this. Um, he can no longer put up these, these pretty pictures and talk about Mexico's moment. And perhaps even more haunting for, for the president at this stage is a question of, is it, is it too late? Is this something that's going to haunt the government throughout the rest of its, of its time? And that's, and that's got to be really, really scary for the administration right now. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, delighted to have uh, Ariel Mutazos from the uh, Mexican Embassy here with us. Uh, Ariel, would you like to thank comment you very much. comments? Thank you very okay. much for for having me here, Duncan, as always, and thank you very much to everyone here in the panel and to the previous panel. Uh, my job here is to, to comment and, uh, on, on what they have said, and as I always say, here is a word from my sponsor. Uh, first of all, I'll take David uh, from the last panel, uh, and I'm going to answer his question. He said that clearly President Ernest Enrique Peña Nieto is uh, good for something, but that he doesn't know what it is. Uh, and that he has uh, done something good, but that he doesn't know what, what he has done. Well, uh, what uh, President Peña Nieto's administration has done is to address the root of the problem rather than just its consequences. And the root of the problem is called institutional weakness. Behind the problem of security in Mexico, uh, and let me say this, Mexico does not have a drug problem. And Mexico... Uh, has a drug trafficking problem, yes, but we have uh, rather a security problem. The drug problem is the consequence of institutional weakness and is a symptom, but that, that's not actually the root of the problem. The root of the problem is uh, lack of uh, institutional strength in security and justice. We have a very, very strong state in, in all other areas of government, but in security and justice we are not yet there, and I have uh, already addressed this uh, issue here in the Institute in previous uh, occasions. Uh, so the difference is simply we cannot just keep addressing this problem uh, by having the police and the military on the streets and by not uh, necessarily solving the root of the problem, which comes from the institutions. It comes from uh, uh, 
lack of community uh, spaces, lack of opportunities there. It, it, we need to restore the social fabric. Uh, in reality, uh, communities and the people are the ones that are more responsible for their security. And I don't mean that they should take the guns out and patrol the streets. I mean that when you uh, occupy public spaces, when you go to buy something or you take your kids to school or you go out and, and bicycle around, you are actually using your communitary spaces and that obviously um, kind of uh, uh, avoids or, or makes more difficult for the criminals to go around and, and walk in those streets. And that's what we need to, to take back. We need to prevent violence by creating opportunities uh, for employment, uh, for education uh, in, our, in our communities. And we also need something very important, which is territorial control. Uh, territorial control in some parts of Mexico was uh, more or less surrendered to the, to the criminals. Um, and uh, with the new gendarmerie uh, of 5,000 elements, this uh, is their main um, area of action. This is their main objective right now, and the gendarmerie will grow. But territorial control, as I said, is very important uh, in terms of, of security. And here I will try to connect uh, with another concept that uh, came up uh, with Alejandro and practically with, with everyone in terms of uh, uh, the making a, a, or adopting a model of a single state police rather than uh, having the local police forces that we have. Uh, Alejandro has questioned that and other uh, analysts here, have, experts here have other also questioned that. But let me tell you, uh, let me give you an example rather than just giving you the, the theory behind that. Um, in Mexico City, we have 35,000 police officers. The average age of those is more than 43, probably around 45. They are not very well armed. They all have just probably a Smith & Wesson, 38, maybe a 45 <laughs> at best. They do have uh, good police cars, acceptable, um, but, and, and they are overweight. We, we have to say that. Maybe either they eat so much tacos or so many tacos, or they don't exercise as much as they should, but they are overweight. But they are a lot. 35,000 police officers for one city, like Mexico City, uh, is a living example of what means critical mass for the police. And this is very important. If we have a municipality in Mexico with 100 police officers to which organized crimes arrives with guns and with money, and they tell them either we kill you or you work for us, what do you think is the choice that they will have? And they cannot ask to another police force of the vicinity of another municipality to give them support because they don't have uh, authority to act in that, uh, let's, let's say, territory or municipality or jurisdiction, however you want to call it. So it is very important to give police support um, of the government. And that can only come uh, from what they call centralization, which is certainly a centralization at the state level, uh, so that they can have uh, superiority, at least in terms of the numbers. And I have seen this firsthand when I worked at the uh, Office of the Attorney General. In three minutes, you had uh, three patrols, three, uh, three cars of police officers. In five minutes, you had 15. And in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you had 300 police officers outside the house of uh, some uh, uh, drug dealer or some person that you were uh, you know, undertaking a search warrant. And it was over. Because it didn't matter if they had AK-47s and they were 10. They, they are not about to shoot. 300 police officers all with guns. So it's not ideal. The, the police force of Mexico City uh, lacks many, many things. But Mexico City is certainly a very, very safe city compared to uh, other uh, places in Mexico and other places in Latin America and other places in the world and considering its size. And the main reason for that is the size of the police force. So we have 35,000 police officers. You know how many we have in the country, federal police officers? 42,000. So we have just a little bit uh, more than 7,000 police officers for the whole country than what we have just for Mexico City. 
So it is a matter of critical mass. And when you have critical mass, it's also more difficult to corrupt the, 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 the policemen because they cannot coordinate uh, for purposes of corruption as well as very small forces. So obviously, bigger forces are more difficult to corrupt. Uh, uh, and in that sense, I think that the, that the single state police model will work because uh, at least we will have critical mass. And it will be more uh, uh, easy or easier to train them. It's uh, easier to vet them. It's easier to have uh, uh, to undertake uh, some investigations of internal affairs. Um, it's easier to get uh, actionable intelligence uh, to work. And it has many other advantages. Uh, that's why the state uh, model for police forces is uh, what, what President Peña Nieto has chosen uh, and he has expressed so in, in, um, in his 10 points and in other uh, occasions uh, as, the, as the path that we are following already in, in Mexico. Uh, and they gave the example of Tijuana, and I agree uh, with David. Uh, Tijuana has made a lot of progress, and uh, the model of Tijuana is very much like the model that we are uh, trying to uh, implement uh, in, in each state of, of, of our country. Um, and uh, just to clarify, a mando unico, or the single command, is not the same as, uh, as a single state uh, police uh, uh, command. I don't know if it has been said here, but sometimes w we, we uh, see that confusion uh, uh, there. And uh, with that said, in terms of, of the security strategy, let me, well, uh, and, and finally just, let me just say that corruption is sometimes the cause of many problems, but taken in, per in perspective, and strategically uh, uh, visualizing it, corruption is really not uh, the root, but the consequence of uh, weakness of institutions and lack of, uh, of uh, decent levels or acceptable levels of rule of law. So corruption certainly can be uh, addressed through programs or to, uh, through laws like the one that uh, President Peña Nieto has already uh, proposed to Congress and it has been passed. But Mainly, corruption will go down almost automatically after we uh, strengthen our institutions. And uh, the objective here, and I always say that because it's necessary to repeat, is not to end up with drug trafficking. That's impossible. It would be a very good objective, but it's not achievable. The objective here is to, in some places, restore and in others, uh, guarantee peace and tranquility for the Mexican citizens in their community and to uh, take back uh, only to the state the monopoly of <coughs> the use of force, the use of violence, um, and certainly to guarantee uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the ability and the right that the state has to uh, charge taxes and make laws and enforce the law. So that's, that's, uh, that's the objective and that's how we translate uh, success in Mexico. Uh, and let me now go very quickly to the I don't trust your objectivity or your balance I or your fairness, man. Time, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that I can certainly attest to that. <laughs> uh, let me now talk uh, very quickly about uh, Ayotzinapa and about Iguala, because one of the miscommunication uh, problems of, 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 of this issue is that, for example, I don't know if you knew, but Ayotzinapa is uh, more than 100 miles away from Iguala. And uh, the, the communication, uh, uh, let's say, uh, distortions have uh, put it almost in, a, in the same place or close to Iguala, but it is not. And it is just one of the many uh, misconceptions of, of uh, uh, the problems, uh, the tragedy at Iguala that, that we need to, to contextualize. And let me be very clear here uh, at the risk of uh, sounding aggressive, I do not mean that, but let me be very clear. Uh, I heard uh, Sandra, if I believe it's correct, that we have seen Ayotzinapa over and over again. That is not only speculation, that is totally false. Let me repeat that. We have not seen Ayotzinapa over and over again. Uh, maybe I heard you incorrectly, but you said that one of your sources or? I said that Ayotzinapa reveals the collusion between government officials or police forces in some cases with criminal, with criminal uh, organizations. And that has been the case, not the, mass, not, not the massive uh, uh, 
uh, the, the, the dimension of Ayotzinapa, but what I meant is that many other cases in the past have revealed that this collusion between police, local police forces and criminal organizations had been occurring for the past for a long time, and that has been the cause of many forces appearances in many other states aside from Guerrero, but okay. not that Ayotzinapa, uh, that, those were not my words. No, no, I, I, I know that those were not your words. What I meant is that you were quoting someone that said that. That, that so what that I so what I was from. quoting was Emilio Alvarez y Casa was saying that what is surprising is that Ayotzinapa surprises us because this phenomenon of the collusion between police forces with criminal organizations had been going on for a long time. Well, thank you very much for clarifying that because I was uh, worried. Uh, I just heard that and I was uh, worried to to clarify. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, in terms of of, uh, of Iguala and the and the facts, uh, the tragedy of Iguala, uh, Stephen asked. Uh, Stephen said that the public, uh, for some reason, do not do not buy uh, the version of the government, and that uh, and that there is this uh, perception that the president just don't get it. And I'm going to say two two things uh, that are probably obvious, but everything is obvious until five minutes later. Uh, and first is that the fact that the president does not acknowledge acknowledges publicly something continuously or regularly does not mean that he doesn't know about it. And most importantly most important is importantly he that doesn't mean that he is not doing something about that. First of all. Uh, and second of all, uh, the truth is one and the, and the results of the investigation of, of the Attorney General's office in coordination with all the security institutions in Mexico uh, is truthful, and it's the truth, regardless of whether someone believes it or not. So the truth does not depend from credibility or, or for, from someone believing it or not. It's just the plain truth. And I think that no one can contest one thing. And that thing is that the investigation on the, on the facts of Ayotzinapa has been the biggest investigation in the history of Mexico, and it has been impeccably articulated. We have right now, Stephen and friends and in the audience, we have right now, a, a few days less than uh, four months after the tragedy, uh, we have managed to uh, detain 97 people, including 36 municipal police officers, 24 from Iguala, 12 from Cocula, that are members also of Guerreros Unidos, including its leader, its top financial operative, and the members allegedly responsible for, cap for capturing and transferring the students. These 97 individuals have been convicted of 221 crimes. And let me say this uh, again in another way. We have the intellectual authors of the massacre in jail, and they are not only uh, on, their, on their prosecution. The alleged intellectual authors, there's also, there's still something called presumption of innocence. Uh, sorry? The alleged intellectual authors, there, there's something, okay. something called presumption oh, of I'm, innocence. I'm going to say that. And they are, not, they, are not going, they are not only investigated right now, they are under trial. And until they are, uh, the, the trial is finished and they are sentenced, they are, as Alejandro said, uh, they, they can be considered the, the ones that are guilty. We have them. We have the, the suspects of being the intellectual authors of, of the massacre uh, under arrest. Uh, and, and when the victims, uh, the, fa the parents of these 43 students, uh, decided that they wanted to have also some, a team of forensics, forensic experts from another country to guarantee the investigation, we accepted them. And we not only accepted the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Commission to have, uh, to, to contribute or, or collaborate in the investigation, actually we called them prior to, to anyone proposing that. And they are investigating uh, uh, and they are involved in the investigation that the government is making. Please. Um, and I really would like to leave a little bit of time for, a, for one round of questions. I, I, was, know that we're I was sharp and right to the point. But I, 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 what I would just say is that for me the amazing thing is, and, and perhaps to your point, is that Despite all of this, that, that's where I'm going with this, please. So, <clears throat> so that, that is an undeniable fact. That the government of Mexico has done not only everything at its reach, but has performed a historic investigation in which less than four months, we have 
the majority of the suspects of, of the massacre in terms of intellectual authors and material authors. With that said, I'm going to fall for a temptation in one minute, two, English time. Uh, I'm going to fall for, for a temptation. Uh, Alejandro Hope is very good at communicating, and so Stephen is. And communication is supposedly my speciality. And uh, Alejandro was mentioning uh, a few minutes ago that um, that you know uh, he was uh, commenting on 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 the on the Attorney General giving his uh, responses to the media and uh, this. Uh, Yame can say phrase or I am tired phrase, uh, showing uh, uh, you know a concept that has been uh, retaken in, in many tweets and, and all over all over the protests. Which, by the way, in Mexico we see protests as the most important sign that Mexicans do not accommodate violence in their lives, and that after a few years of having violence in some territories, in some municipalities of our country, we still uh, do not accommodate violence in our lives, and I think that's very important to say. But going back to what Alejandro and, and Stephen just uh, said, uh, perceptions do matter. And I don't have answers, but I have questions in this regard. I think it's very interesting, and I will try to say this, uh, uh, or to give these questions as much as I can, on a personal uh, level. I think that it's very interesting to see the communicational side of this, of this uh, issue. Um, I'm not sure how, we, how is it that we went from having a mayor of a town and a wife allegedly you know, uh, giving an order to the police to stop students and then passing them to the uh, to a criminal organization from Yame Canse renuncia Peña Nieto and the government is <laughs> the problem or guilty of all this i think that communicationally is very interesting to at least ask oneself who is behind this how did we go from from having and knowing the person that allegedly performed this and gave the order to just distracting all this attention and, put it and put, putting it into the federal government. How did we pass from one thing into another thing? Uh, and I think that communicationally it's very interesting because perceptions does matter, uh, do matter. And, uh, and for some reason, and going back to the point that you made, I think that perceptions are very important. Public sentiment is very important. Uh, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln used to say that public sentiment was everything. But in terms of public sentiment in Mexico, I'm not sure that <laughs> things have just naturally flowed. Because if things have, uh, if these were the case, then we would not see the attention uh, just how can I say that, distracted to another, to another pl uh, place, to another debate, and to another entity, and even to another person, than the original persons that should actually uh, grab the attention and should be considered as the suspects of being responsible uh, as intellectual or material authors of this, of this issue. They are questions. Obviously not answers. Ariel, why don't we, why don't we take up the Thank questions and, and go to it in the, in the Q&A now. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much for a spirited uh, participation. Thank you, sir. Um, we are over time already, but let's take, we've got three questions right there. You guys get the, the, the reward. So let's take all three of these questions. We'll have a round of answers. Please, right here. Isn't that interesting? Who's behind that? There's a microphone coming. Please identify yourself. Coming through here. Hi, Carrie Bauer with Coast Guard International Affairs. And um, this question is for Mr. Hope. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the alternatives you mentioned to President sure. Peña Nieto's 10-point uh, plan. And also, if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the, the focus that's been put more on um, building stronger communities and having community programs, and if you think that, that, that that's a viable um, solution and if they're being effectively administered to help 
contribute to improving security. Thank situation. you very much. We're going to take a question down here on the left, and then we'll finish up with, uh, with Claire Silke uh, towards the back. Hi, I'm Bernadette from Georgetown University. I'm a graduate student. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Ariel. <coughs> if indeed uh, Mexico has corruption as a result of weak institutions, then how, in fact, will Mexico, the state, rebuild the legitimacy that has come as a result of these weak institutions and the corruption that has happened as a result? I think that if we look at a timeline of Mexico from 68 till now, unfortunately, the, the relationship continues to be uh, a, and a result of Ayotzinapa. It's unfortunate. It pains me because I love the country. So in that sense, how will Mexico move forward in rebuilding that legitimacy, and how can we <coughs> begin to think about the rule of law and the rebuilding of the judiciary systems? Thank you. Last question for Claire. I'm uh, Claire Silky, and I'm with uh, CRS. And I just had a question. Um, when I read the Mexican government's response to um, Iguala, the thing that interested me was I was wondering in any of these cases where it's a, a local or state issue, why it, um, is it something in the federal structure that you guys are thinking of reforming as part of the 10-point plan where federal officials, the federal attorney general's office has to give a go to the state level people, even if they're totally inadequate, the local PGR, you know, the state level investigators are horrible. If you know that, does the Mexican Constitution allow the federal PGR to step in before seven to ten days go by? Um, that happened in the other case, too, in, in uh, state of Mexico. You know, are you allowed to step in? And also when, when it was said that federal forces couldn't have helped the, the students because the because if they had, they, be, they would have had to have been requested by, that, by the local officials, and in that case, they would have been acting against the students. Like the federal police that were there and the military that were there, well, they couldn't help out because the help wasn't requested by the local or state people, and even if they had, they would have been, they would have been doing bad, not good. Don't they have freedom of action to protect civilians? That's what I'm wondering. And if they don't, what do they need to do? Is that a reform you're thinking of? Because it seems strange. Thank you, Claire. Uh, let's begin with Alejandro. Okay, uh, in terms of alternatives, I think, I mean, the move towards single state police forces, um, I mean, is problematic on a number of levels, but th there, are, there are ways, uh, that does not mean that we need to maintain all 1,800 municipal state uh, police forces. Um, that you could make this thing, you could establish a process or a certification, not of individual police officers, but of, of police forces. If a police force does not meet a certain minimum criteria, then you could have a federal intervention, or then you could have that police force merge into to other uh, other um, other forces. I mean, you could set up rules, say, um, let me give you a, a couple of examples. For instance, in Spain, municipalities under 5,000 under 5,000 inhabitants do not have their own police forces. But municipalities over 5,000 can have their police forces under certain uh, criteria. Uh, <laughs> Canada has a similar, a similar system. Uh, small, very small municipalities do not have their own police forces. They either have the, the Mounties or they have the provincial police. But, uh, but you could uh, have, uh, but uh, larger towns can have their own. Um, and it's not, we should not confuse order with geometry. Let me put it this way. There is no, I mean, some, there is no reason why Mexico should have 32 state police forces. I mean, Canada, in Canada, only three provinces have their own police forces. The rest is national and then local. Or Spain, similar thing. You could have, you have uh, only two regional, two regions of Spain have their own police forces, the Basque Country and Catalonia. Uh, <coughs> the rest of them depend on the national police forces in that case, and on local police forces. You, so you, there, are, there are many alternatives to, to in terms of uh, police reform. But whatever you do in terms of police reform, the key issue is not where is, uh, how many forces there are, but how those forces are actually governed, whether there is ex internal control, whether there is external oversight. And those issues are not being tackled right now. And secondly, uh, I would argue that one missing part of the equation that was not mentioned by, by uh, President Peña Nieto on November 27th was uh, reform of prosecutorial capabilities and strengthening of prosecutorial capabilities. There was not a single word about uh, the so-called procuradurias or fiscalias. Um, I think that's one key 
a uh, uh, key uh, issue area where we should uh, the, uh, start devoting more efforts. Um, there's already an effort, uh, there's already a process whereby the federal attorney general's office will become an autonomous body. The same could be start, uh, we should be start doing the same with the local bodies. And just, uh, and for Claire um, here, yes, there's something called the Facultad de Atracción. The PGR has something, a power whereby they can attract a, 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 a specific case. They, they do have that preview. They Thank you, Alejandro. Ariel. Um, so to answer how to rebuild legitimacy, well, uh, it has many uh, fronts, but I'm going to address the most popular one. You believe in the institutions when they work. So if we, and we are actually flying the plane while building it, but if we, we are strengthening our institutions, and if we uh, make them work up to a point, uh, and this point has been reached already in some uh, uh, states or municipalities that <coughs> were not there before, uh, if we take them to a point in which the people know that when something unlawfully happens and they have, or, or a crime is committed, the institutions will actually, you know, respond by getting that person or the responsibles uh, for that crime and uh, investigating them and processing them, taking them to a judge and then uh, uh, to jail, then that's the way in which we will restore legitimacy. Uh, there are, and I'm going to actually answer this question and that question in the same answer, there are a few deadlines and a few things that we can call uh, important plot points or um, semi-goals uh, in, this, in this path. One of them is the institutional, uh, sorry, the judicial reform that will have to be ready uh, by 2016, uh, in which we'll, uh, we will transit from uh, an, uh, uh, you know, a written inquisitorial system into an oral accusatorial uh, kind of model. That will certainly make a big difference. Um, going to a state police uh, model will also uh, make a big difference. Uh, and all the other 10 points of uh, President Peña Nieto and others that the government has uh, already expressed in, in other opportunities are actually part of the same effort of strengthening institutions uh, in Mexico in terms of security and justice. When we achieve a uniform level in the country, uh, not only at the federal level, which h seems to have more, uh, have made more progress, but also at the state level and at the municipal level of uh, the rule of law, then we, we can think that uh, that legitimacy has been rebuilt. <laughs> and it will happen naturally after the, the population sees that. After we uh, manage to achieve what I said is the objective, which is to restore in some places and in others to guarantee peace and tranquility for the Mexicans in their communities. That is the main objective of a Mexico in peace uh, that was set by President uh, Peña Nieto. And then to answer the, the other question, um, which are three questions actually, one of them uh, has already been answered and partly the other has also answered, uh, was, was also answered. Um, I will repeat more or less what the Attorney General said when he was asked uh, your same question about the participation of federal forces in the events of Iguala. Uh, if they had participated or someone had called federal forces, they would obviously uh, have been, had supported the local authorities because the first assu assumption that you do is not that the local authorities uh, or that the local police forces are corrupt uh, at to, up to some extent. The first assumption that the federal uh, force, like the military or like the police force, uh, sorry, the federal police uh, does, is that they have to support the local forces. Because in some places, especially in Guerrero, they are weak because of the institutional uh, uh, weakness that I just said. So, so that's, that's the case, and, and that's his answer, and that's also my answer uh, to that case. Uh, <laughs> but certainly, this is something that I know 
it's also part of the case and the investigation uh, of this. And I'm sure that if this becomes relevant or if something like this did happen, which up to this moment we have no uh, uh, public information that uh, my government has already disclosed in the sense that it happened. Uh, uh, but if this comes up as something that happened or takes some relevance, then uh, I'm sure that the government uh, through the Attorney General's office uh, will, will uh, talk further uh, about this. Um, I think that's, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been very, very patient with us, but please join me in thanking our excellent panelists here today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Claro que es un misterio, cabrón.